How did you get started in robotics? And, and you, because there's always that nucleus of, of, that takes your career in a different way, right? Yeah, that's a funny way to describe it, actually, when you say it takes your career in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually got into robotics very indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, as an undergraduate, I was a, in physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a long time, I was really sure that you know, physics was my field. It was the thing I wanted to do. That was the path I was going to pursue. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a lot that was just very appealing about physics from the, uh, the point of view of understanding the world and this beautiful idea of reductionism that uh, everything in the universe, you know, all the variety we encounter uh, can be explained in terms of you know, four forces and, and six particles. Mm. Uh, and then at some point in my undergraduate physics training, uh, I found that the, uh, the experience that I had with encountering modern physics uh, was different from what I had what had originally drawn me to the subject. Uh, so it, it was sort of less about things that involved understanding the world in any sort of intuitive way, uh, and more about sort of doing math and magical manipulations on a page that wound up, uh, you know, having great predictive power, but mm. not in any sort of way that felt satisfying to me. Mm, mm. Uh, and. Uh, Around that time, I read actually a popular press book on complex systems research. This was in the, the late 90s, uh, and I think it was, it was starting to become sort of a, a field that was popularly discussed, you know, beyond the people who had been working on it. Uh, and uh, this idea of, of complex systems and of emergence uh, actually as a counterpoint to the reductionism that uh, had been drawing me to physics. Uh, it seemed like it actually was much more interesting and in some ways uh, more satisfying, you know, if, if it could be answered. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather than how, do, how does everything that we encounter, you know, get boiled down to a few forces and particles, uh, the opposite question is actually, in a sense, much richer. It's how do we go from just a handful of forces and particles to all of the incredible variety that we encounter. That seemed like in some ways a, a very, you know, rich, compelling intellectual mm. problem. Uh, so uh, when I applied to graduate schools, uh, I actually wound up applying in seven or eight different fields because mm. uh, I, I wasn't sure, because there is no, or certainly wasn't at the time, there's no sort of department of complex systems I could apply to. Mm. Uh, so I applied to places that looked like they were working on interesting problems. So I applied to a couple of physics departments. Uh, for things like condensed matter research. Mm -hmm. um, I applied to a few neuroscience departments. Uh, I applied to MIT actually in three different departments for <laughs> you know, different interesting things. And um, uh, I wrote my application essays about a couple different things. And uh, one of the themes I, I wrote about, for instance, for neuroscience programs mm -hmm. was uh, the brain. Mm -hmm. It was, was consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, because that's mm -hmm. you know, maybe the, the closest to home mm -hmm. amazing emergent system. You yeah. know, we've got this uh, you know block of 10 to the 12 neurons that let's pretend for the sake of argument that a neuron is simple, which it isn't even a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, and connect them up in the right way, mm -hmm. and we get basically magic, right? Yeah, we, yeah. It, to us, it's like the experience of consciousness mm -hmm. is is magic. You know, yeah, like, I still I'm, remember I read Daniel Dennett uh, yeah. uh, and, and Douglas Hofstadter and the mind's eye, and, and yeah, I got just slightly spooked out when I'm thinking I exist somewhere in yeah. there, and it's slightly flowing it's like around. This illusion of consciousness. And, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And it's like you know, I I can just think about something happening in the world, and it's happening. This hand is moving. That's amazing. And like, yeah, what's uh, doing this? anyway? So yeah, so it's yeah, but it is. So uh, mm. so that was a, mm. a thing that I wrote these uh, mm. the neuroscience essays mm. about. Like, I want to understand consciousness. Mm. Uh, and how that emerges from the interactions of neurons. Mm. Uh, one of the other things that uh, was a, a really compelling sort of driving research question for me mm. was I had read about these uh, termite colonies mm. where you've got you know, millions of termites each sort of going around doing its own thing, reacting mm. to whatever it encounters. Mm. Uh, and somehow from all of their uh, actions and interactions, you wind up with these massive complex structures. Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, how, how, it, how does that work? Mm. Uh, and actually, I was already interested in the opposite question. Uh, so that, that shows us that it can be done, mm. right? You know, they, so understanding how the termites build the termite mounds mm. is one great question. Mm. Another question is, uh, how could you create a system? How would you program mm. the individual agents mm. to get a particular uh, emergent result that you wanted. Ah, to yeah. The, In, the instead structure. of a mound, you would you want something else, and how do you go? Yeah, very exactly. interesting. So that was one of the things that I wrote these essays about because that was a problem I really wanted to mm. to investigate. Mm. Uh, and at that time, really nobody was working on that kind of problem. Mm. 
Uh, and I wound up actually going to MIT mm -hmm. and joining a neuroscience lab mm -hmm. uh, in computational neuroscience. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this probably you know, shows my, um, uh, my impatience, but uh, after three or four years mm -hmm. of studying neuroscience, mm -hmm. uh, I came to the personal conclusion that uh, science is unlikely to understand consciousness within my lifetime. I would uh, think in, so, In yeah. a way that I feel like is, is you know, the, the kind of personally satisfying understanding mm. that, that I thought I was looking for. Mm. Uh, though, of course, you know, great progress has been made in, in you know, mm. parts of the question. Mm. Um, so it was actually pretty late in my uh, graduate career. Mm. Uh, I was, I had I'd wound up sort of going off and working with a few different people on different kinds of topics. And one of these at some point, uh, I was at this stage, which I understand is very typical in, mm. in extended graduate programs, mm. uh, where I was just sick of everything. Mm. Just like I absolutely wanted to just write up whatever I had and get out, and who cares what comes next? Mm. Uh, and I was talking with uh, one of the uh, PIs I was working with mm. uh, on, on, you know, some other mm. problem, and, and he and, and I expressed this kind of general mm. dissatisfaction, and, and he asked me, "So, what would you work on if you could pick any problem? Mm. What would it be?" Mm. And I said, "Well." You know, for a long time, I've really wanted to work on this thing with the, you know, as I described, the uh, the termites and mm. the uh, engineering. The both way like of the problem. Yeah. How does termites do it, and how can we reverse the process and control it to get any result we want, right? Yeah, and I was really focusing on the latter. Mm. Like, not, mm. I didn't want mm. to go out and study termites exactly, mm. Uh, mm. but you know, I wanted to say like, okay, great. So that that shows us it can be done. It works, right? Right. You know. So then, how do how could we create a system mm. that works like that? Mm. Uh, and he said. You know, if you'd said almost anything else, I would have advised you to go to like to finish what you're mm -hmm. write up your dissertation, graduate, and, and try to go switch and work mm -hmm. on that other thing mm -hmm. as a postdoc. Mm -hmm. But that's something that I think you could actually do in a reasonable time mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for your dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so it was in like my fifth year of grad school that I switched to that topic. Okay, brave, huh? Yeah, well, and uh, and it worked out. Like mm -hmm. that was. Uh, it turned out to be a problem that I was actually, you know, able to to make real progress on. Mm. Uh, it became my dissertation, mm. uh, and uh, you know, most of it was theory because mm. you know I'm really interested in theory. Mm. Uh, and um, I wound up building a sort of proof of concept system mm. uh, as a hardware demonstration, mm. uh, literally out of things that were lying around the MIT building. Mm. Uh, because in robotics, as I found, as when I started. Uh, Submitting papers, mm -hmm. uh, you really, they really want you to have a robot. Yeah, yeah. The, it's and, called robotics, right? Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and there there is great theory in robotics, mm. uh, but especially if you don't have sort of the the background, so people know that you know what you're talking about. Mm. It's incredibly helpful to actually have a physical demonstration mm. as a sort of. Uh, you know, demonstration to, to say like it's okay. I know what I'm talking about. Mm. You, know, you can take me seriously. Yeah, yeah. And it also keeps you grounded. It keeps us from becoming too far from the subject. I think we mentioned that in the beginning. I think the the building the, and you did it. With, it's so cool that you you have the opportunity at Harvard to to just yeah, yeah absolutely do that. Yeah. But that's exactly why it's so important in robotics mm. to to mm. have that you know, mm. because there there is great work in theory, but there's mm. also work in mm. you know theoretical robotics mm. that. Uh, would not really be possible to translate to reality. Mm. And that uh, robot keeps you grounded and yeah. sorts out the good yeah. from the bad and all that stuff. Yeah. So you built this prototype then, and what do you do then? So I wound up doing this uh, this project mm. at, at the end of my uh, graduate program, mm. uh, actually working with Ronika Nagpal, mm. uh, who I had known when we were both graduate students at MIT, mm. uh, and then this other professor who was the one who convinced me that I should do what I actually wanted to do, uh, mm -hmm. suggested I, I go talk to her and see if she wanted to uh, uh, to support this project, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it worked out brilliantly. So, mm -hmm. you know, we wound up uh, starting on this at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I graduated, I did a one-year postdoc with her, and then I went off and I did a different postdoc mm -hmm. on very different kinds of, of subjects. I was doing mm -hmm. some work in evolutionary theory and cancer mm -hmm. modeling. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the Wies Institute was mm -hmm. getting started up, mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd worked with Radhika, of course, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, she was trying to recruit me. I'd done some work with Don Ingber, who was the head mm -hmm. of the Institute, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, he suggested I come, and so uh, this was what I wound up doing. Mm -hmm. So I was describing before mm -hmm. how uh, my interest in this problem was to, to learn about these termites mm -hmm. and say, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, th this, this shows that mm -hmm. 
this can be done, that mm. large numbers of independent agents can together build mm. large-scale complex things. Mm. Uh, that's fantastic. Mm. Uh, how would we program mm. a bunch of termites to do that, mm. a bunch of you know, artificial termites? Mm. Uh, and you know, building the artificial termites obviously is going to be a huge challenge, but mm. that's for someone else to worry about, not, yeah. not my interest. Mm. Uh, so around the time the Wies Institute was starting up, uh, Kirsten Peterson mm. in Denmark mm. uh, was working on very much the same problem. Mm. Uh, she had learned about the termites and said, this is fantastic, this shows this can be done. Mm. How would you build a bunch of termites, a bunch of robots, mm. you know, to build the thing you want? Mm. And I don't really care how you program them. Someone else is going to worry about that. Uh, I see a beautiful friendship exactly, starting here. Exactly. Huh? So, uh, so her advisor uh, talked to Casper Stoy, mm. uh, who had done work with Radhika, mm. uh, and they sort of you know, engineered that uh, uh, Ronka hired uh, Kirsten to, mm. to come work at the Vs. She recruited me mm. uh, exactly because you know the, the carrot was mm. we're going to get to do exactly this thing that's mm. really been driving us. Yeah, and you've been interested in this proje project for a very long time. Exactly. And I also think that it's been in your mind for a long time, and your mind has matured around that issue. I'm quite sure there's there's something like that going Maybe. on. Maybe it, it definitely gets easier to think about the longer you think about it. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. Yeah, so then, you, you, then you're there, you've got somebody dealing with the hardware and... Uh, so that's, that's when the Termis project started in mm. 2009, uh, mm. when, when we all started at the VIS. Mm. Uh, the VIS, in fact, started in 2009. Mm. Uh, and, you know, we started working on uh, exactly the thing that, that we published, mm. you know, four plus years later. Mm. Uh, it just took a while to get there. <laughs> I would presume yeah. so. It is a very complicated problem. And uh, since you also have the hardware and you're in robotics, you have this robot, it actually has to perform the tasks that your algorithms, it has to be verifiable, right? Yeah. And, uh, and to me, that's where the, the bulk of the challenge is. Yeah. So the hardware to me was really the, uh, the, the most amazing part of the project, the mm. thing where the greatest amount of effort and mm. sort of requirement went into. Mm. And, and Kirsten is just brilliant. Like yeah. she, she managed to make this work. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it may be that she has a different perspective because, you know, she's used to working on robots and, mm. and you know, less so about algorithms. But, mm. uh, you know, for my thinking, like the algorithm part was straightforward. That's, you know, it's in theory, everything mm. works in theory, mm. you know, but getting something to work in real life mm. is amazing. Mm. She does the hardware and yeah, there's this beautiful partnership that way. Yeah. But at the same time, this is actually a, a really uh, true partnership. I mean, mm. All three of us who were co-authors mm. on the paper really mm. you know, contributed to every aspect of the project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's part of what made it possible mm. uh, to to get all the way from beginning to end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was you know we were we were talking very deeply from the beginning about mm. what the right design decisions to make mm. were, mm. Uh, about you know what are the reasonable things that are attainable for the robots to do, and what mm. are the things they need to be able to do in mm. order to uh, you know accomplish something mm. reasonable altogether, mm. uh, and as uh, you know, things changed in real life, and as experiments showed that you know something was more or less feasible, we'd sometimes mm. change uh, our thinking. But it was, you know, we were all really working on all aspects of that, mm. uh, and that's I think a, a big part of, of why it wound up being uh, successful. Mm. Uh, you know, both with the, the strong theoretical foundation, but mm. uh, through the, the real life realization. Mm, mm, mm. All of you bringing that essential component and fitting together and then doing it as a team. Yeah. I think that that's, that is where any great work comes from and every great science certainly comes from. I mean, we see so many Nobel laureates having one or two or three people on the same ticket, so to say, and it just comes in there and, and the minds support each other, and and you said also Kirsten had talked about uh, thought about the termites, uh, the termites might problem ahead of time. So you were all kind of on the same page there right. and already. Right, so we'd each done sort of different kinds of work on this subject yeah. beforehand. That Again, it gets easier to think about the longer you exactly. do it. So can so the, the, could you tell us any key points in the termites project, termites project that you think that were revelations that that really said, wow, we really. Took and took it to the next level. Nothing is really coming to mind. It's mm. it's a good question, but mm. uh, you know, in some sense, I mean, my experience when I started mm. uh, working on on this topic mm. completely in theory, mm. uh, the biggest surprise, in a sense, was that it wound up tractable. Mm. Mm. You know, it is like actually it, it, possible. In, in a sense, it, it didn't have to be. Mm. Like it could have been that you know, I sat down to to try to understand a, mm. a literally incomprehensible system mm. and. That you know that it could have turned out to be a thing that you know no human could make progress on. Mm, yeah. uh, as it turned out, it was mm. very tractable. Like it mm. was, it was straightforward to sort mm. of start in one place and, and uh, increase in complexity and, and build up this mm. 
uh, you know, sort of algorithmic framework to mm. describe the, um, the, the building of, of collective structures. Mm. Uh, so when we started the Termes project, mm. uh, in a sense, like that, that wasn't a surprise. We, we basically knew that we were going to be able to get there, mm. certainly from the algorithmic standpoint. Kirsten was very confident that mm. from the hardware standpoint she could mm. get there. Mm. Uh, and so it was sort of just a question of you know, how to get there and where exactly we were trying to get. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Feasible. What is the, yeah. Yeah, the minimum requirements for the, I mean, you're not going to go out and build a real house for someone, that's for, for another project, but really the, the, the technical demonstrator has to be the, 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 most, the sim most simple one that's good enough, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and when you're really starting a new project from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a much bigger risk mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you mm -hmm. really don't know whether this thing that no one has tried to do before is mm -hmm. actually going to wind up being doable. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, where were the? I mean, we've seen now. I mean, the the theoretical framework is proven that given enough blocks or building blocks, uh, a, a group of these o autonomous agents will complete the structure as mm, predicted, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, that's so a it, fundamental thing we can all rely on, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is that if you're the, the user, you know, you, mm -hmm. if you're the person who wants this group of robots to build you something, you can give them a blueprint of what you want mm -hmm. them to build, mm -hmm. uh, but no instructions about how to go about building it. Mm -hmm. Just show them the final result that you want mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, give them a supply of building material yeah. and walk away mm -hmm. and they'll do the rest themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the, 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 I mean, for the listener, we, for the viewer, we might say that this doesn't depend on the fact that nothing goes wrong or, or anything right. like that. So it, there's, it, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot that's going to be very unpredictable. Mm. Like you may not know how many robots you have. Mm. Uh, the number might change during mm. the process. You might lose some. Maybe mm. things are going too slowly. You bring in some more robots to mm. join the team. Mm. Uh, you don't know what order they're going to wind up doing things mm. in. You know, they, they might encounter things unpredictably. Mm. You don't know what the mm. exact timing of their actions is going mm. to be. Uh, so this kind of thing kind of makes it uh, you know, inappropriate, if not intractable, to try to use a, a traditional planning approach mm. when you've got, you know, you're in, instead you're trying to take this swarm approach where mm. you just sort of throw a lot of self-controlled mm. agents at the problem mm. uh, and let them handle the details. Mm. So even if, if, if we have one wor robot working when the project ends and at least as many building blocks as required, the project will end, right? Correct. I mean, and of course, those two things have to be fulfilled. We have to have at least one working robot and at least the same, the, the, the minimum amount of components we need. Right, and, and, and you could push that further. I mean, there are ways in which things can fail mm. that, you know, can really cause problems and could mm. prevent completion, for, mm. for instance. Mm. Uh, I mean, there are, there are mistakes mm. that, let's suppose, you know, that, that are certainly possible, mm -hmm. you know, that can be made, mm -hmm. uh, that require a certain amount of work to, uh, to detect and to mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So as long as the mistakes are being detected and corrected faster than they're being made, ah, yeah, oh, cool. you're still going to keep making progress toward the goal. But, ah, but you know, cool, certainly cool. if you're making mistakes all the time mm -hmm. and not actually and spending all your time fixing things mm -hmm. and actually introducing errors faster than you're solving them, mm -hmm. you're also not going to get to the goal, right? No. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's like um, the, the failure of trans uh, transmitting data. I mean, eventually the Skype right. signal break, breaks down and it's right. not uh, understandable as speech anymore. But right. We know very well our edge, edge cases and they're, they're very... Um, there are there are true edge cases, right? right. And, and 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 they're also reasonable in the fact that if we don't provide enough building material, of course the building is not going to complete. Exactly. I mean, yeah. we, that's not something that should come as a surprise to us. So. Yeah. But then the idea with the uh, the robot programming in the Termes system mm -hmm. uh, is that you know each robot doesn't know. How, you know, it doesn't know anything about the global state of the system. Mm. It doesn't know how many other robots there are. It doesn't mm. know what the others are doing. Mm. It doesn't know how much has already been built. Mm. Uh, it, uh, it has its own sensing. So mm. the robots actually are limited to their own onboard sensing. Very, mm. uh, it's actually very limited. They can only, uh, they have a handful of sensors. They can mm. only tell what's happening really right around themselves. Mm. Uh, and based on that feedback, based mm. on what they encounter, mm. uh, they decide what actions to take. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then the, uh, the trick is in designing their behavior so mm. that all of these together, taking those actions, mm. uh, wind up producing the thing you wanted. And mm. so as they you know, move through the workspace, they mm. don't know what's already been built. Mm. You know, they have no dynamic knowledge about the state of the system. Mm. Uh, and uh, in some sense, you, know, you, you, could, you could imagine a system where they do keep track of what they've already seen. Mm. Uh, but 
in a swarm system where mm. there's really a huge number of, of mm. other agents uh, mm. also active, also changing the world, mm. uh, keeping that information may not actually be useful. No, because, because it's it going to be out of date. Right and, 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 right. and of course, also sharing the information between millions of actors is not also not possible. Not, not trivial. No. Then. Yeah, this is very interesting. Where do you see, I mean, the project is now published in Science. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's the big it's splash. February 14th this year. Yeah, so that's really cool. Uh, so Good uh, Valentine's Day. Yeah, good Valentine's Day, probably from more than one perspective, but that's a great day in any day, right? Uh, and it's also great for robotic science that we're out there and, and, and really participating in at that level of the science debate. So. Yeah, it's really exciting. There's been a, a mm -hmm. number of papers like that more recently. Yeah, and uh, do you? Th I mean, I talk to a lot of people and they say robotics is, is coming into its teens. It's not a toddler mm -hmm. anymore and it's not an adult, but it, and I think that, as you see, I mean, with one or two or more papers coming into these prestigious journals, that wasn't the case five or ten years ago, right? Yeah, I mean, there have been mm -hmm. uh, robotics papers mm -hmm. in science over mm -hmm. time, but uh, they've, they've become more common recently. Yeah, and I think that that's also the feeling I get, I don't know if you agree with me, that the, 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 there is a sign, there's a maturity and a stability in our common knowledge of in within robotics now and there's something to lean on you don't have to do everything from scratch all the time and and i think that that also will make it progress faster and i think we're going to see more and more papers coming into these journals over time because i mean I it's simply so. easier yes. now when you don't have to start from scratch all the time and yeah that's uh, really interesting could you i mean say that we have somebody out there that's now list, uh, viewing this and they're saying oh cool i can have a termite build my house where is the project now? Because it's closed now for you, right? Uh, the Termes project as such is closed. Mm. Uh, mm. So, I mean, we, you know, we wrote up the results of that project. Mm. It was in the science paper. Mm. Kirsten graduated. She's mm. in Europe now. Mm. Uh, we miss her deeply. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, and we're very uh, happy to have her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the, the Termes project, mm. you know, is wrapped mm. up. Collective construction work, we're still working on mm. uh, and in mm. different directions. Mm. Uh, mm. So uh, even uh, at that same time, mm. uh, Radhika was working with the postdoc Niels Knapp. Mm. Uh, he's now a professor at Buffalo mm. uh, on building with amorphous materials. Mm. Mm. Uh, so. Mm, yeah, I, I've seen the work. It's based on uh, kind of expanding foam or, 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 or things that are uh, covered in glue. Uh, he used matchsticks to construct uh, bridges and stuff. Really interesting work yeah, exactly. in, in that perspective. What I think is Termis compared to that is that the, the, the Termis project is uh, it is um, reusable all the time because the, the blocks doesn't really stick to each other and I really like the, the reusability. When you have one structure you could instruct these agents to continuously modify your structure to whatever you need. So uh, I think that's great for the experimental standpoint. Yeah. Like if you're trying to build one set of blocks and reuse them to build yeah. many things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you'd actually want from a construction standpoint. Because I mean, typically, you know, we build a building, mm -hmm. uh, we build it once, mm -hmm. it's finished. Yeah. Right? We don't want to change it after that. And is that only because we can't change it after mm -hmm. that? Or would we actually want to if it were easy enough to, to take things off and put them back on. Yeah, I uh, had some communication with, uh, some, I conversations with architects about this. Uh -huh. And this is a, uh, this is like the term termites for, for, yeah. for architects. Yeah, because they're the, remodeling all the time. Yeah, the they've really been coming back to this problem time and time again of modular buildings. We hear Sh uh, Verne talks about it in 130 years ago or something like that. Uh, of us renewing our cities every year because we just pit, tore all the buildings down and built new ones. And, um, uh, and, and architects have come to these problems throughout the ages of trying to make the buildings adapt to the needs of the users. Yeah, are you continue to work on the, the, this form of construction or is Nil Snap taking over the work? And where are you going from now on, so to speak? Yeah, so lately I've been working with a uh, structural engineer, Paul mm -hmm. Kasabian, mm -hmm. uh, and we're interested in looking at uh, taking this approach to, um, I sort of want to say more, not exactly realistic, real world physical situations, but mm -hmm. um, uh, so here's, here's the setting we're looking at. Um, so one issue is that you know, so we're going to go back three steps, right? So the termites work uh, is inspired by termites, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's inspired at a high level. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, like the termites, the robots 
uh, are acting independently, they're mm. building large stru structures committed to themselves, climbing over the partial structures in progress, they mm. only have local information, they don't know what the mm. others are doing, mm. uh, you know, that kind of, of inspiration. Mm. Uh, but the details of what the uh, the termites are doing mm. are very different from the details of what the robots are doing. Mm. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. One mm. of the reasons uh, is because their goals are very different, mm. right? So termites are not trying to build a specific mound, mm. right? Uh, you know, every mound looks different. They're mm. all recognizably mounds from the same species. Mm. But as you say, it's, it's completely, it's being remodeled all the time. Mm. Uh, it depends on the environment it's built in. Mm. You know, you've, you see a lot of uh, mounds built around trees. Mm. So there's, you know, a giant tree sticking out of the mound and yet mm. there's a functional mound around mm. the tree. Mm. Uh, uh, whereas with human construction projects, mm. Typically, mm. you know, so if, if, uh, typically you, you uh, if you're the person who wants a building, mm. you start with a blueprint. You mm. know exactly what you want built. You give mm. that to the contractor and mm. say, please build me this. Mm. Uh, and if they build you not that, but something kind of similar mm. that looks like it might have, you know, come from the same family. So one of the uh, ideas with the, the Termes project was for this kind of thing to be relevant mm. to human construction, we mm. wanted to have the capability of building completely predefined things. Mm. Mm. Uh, now, we also demonstrated that, you know, of course, you can use the same system to build things that are not completely predefined. Mm. Uh, this is uh, it's actually something that I, I think, um, uh, it's, it's sort of a minor point in the paper, mm. but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to overlook completely, mm. Mm. that, uh, you know, we, we gave some mm. fairly trivial algorithms mm. for uh, here's how to use the same system and build something where the, the whole form uh, emerges from the construction process and it's not actually predictable in advance. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, as I say, understandable that wasn't the main contribution. But, mm. Uh, mm. but the, um, uh, but that's, mm. you know, more what termites are doing. Mm. Uh, mm. And when we, uh, so, to, so again, mm. go back to you as the person who wants mm. a building built, mm. uh, you don't just go to the contract with the blueprint. Mm. Actually, that's the second step. The first step is you go to an architect mm. and you say, I've got this site, mm. which I haven't really looked at, mm. yeah, and uh, and I have some idea of what mm. I want built there. Yeah, I need three bedrooms, a kitchen, bathroom, right. the basics they know, right? Right. You give me a blueprint mm. and the architect does that. Mm. They organize it, where's the sun coming in, where's the neighbors, where's right. the road. They look at the site, uh, where you want to have your garden, and, and they, they take all these very hard decisions that, again, when you thought about them for a long time, like the architects have, it's easier. But for a, for a novice, it's very hard because there's right. so many of them and they all, I mean, if you move the patio, you got to move the bathroom and then you move the bedrooms and suddenly the patio is in the wrong place again and you just start all over, right? Right. So this work that I've been doing with Paul, mm -hmm. uh, the idea is to, uh, to automate some of that as well, mm -hmm. to, to let the uh, structure that's being built uh, come out of the function that you mm -hmm. want to specify, but not the precise plan. Ah, okay, so, so to, taking it a step further there, really right, interesting. And, yeah. and to take advantage of mm -hmm. elements that already exist in the environment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that actually, you know, Roddick and I have been talking about forever, that's mm -hmm. Niels's work, that, mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, making use of the environment to, mm -hmm. uh, to build something that performs a function. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that uh, I'm doing with Paul, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at uh, building with a framework of uh, scaffolding struts mm. and robots that can measure local forces on what they're building. Mm. Uh, and uh, the idea is for them to, you know, again, be sort of taking local measurements, local decisions, mm. and deciding, uh, you know, based on the forces here, is mm. this going to be strong enough to let me keep building higher? Mm, or should, sure, I, should I add a new pole? Yeah. Short up, exactly. Yeah. And, mm. uh, uh, and to build things that perform a function. Mm. Uh, like, you know, if there's a gap in the environment that you need to bridge from one side to the other, mm. you know, build some bridge, mm. right? And if uh, the ground is uneven, flatten it out so that the next level can, can, can be, instance, a, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, although if you're building out of, you know, scaffolding tubes, mm. you're probably not, you know, that, that's a more sort of open, mm. uh, you know, strut-based yeah. kind of, of plan, so mm. uh, less with the solid, as you were saying. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that's something we've been uh, Working on a little bit, we've been uh, we've had uh, three uh, very good undergraduates over the mm. summer uh, mm. who've looked at different aspects of this problem. Mm. Um, so that's a direction that uh, that we're trying to take this uh, collective construction work in the future. Yeah, very interesting. And I think that the the the, f the theoretical work and the practical work you've done, where you show us that 
what your original problem was? Can we can can we add input in the reverse version of the ter termites project and say I want this, and could we actually get it out the other end, both from a theoretical yep. point of view yep. and from a practical point of view? Is is it's it's in science because it most li most certainly deserves to be there. It is a fundamental thing that so many be will be able to 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 rely on when they go on and and develop take these in in, in directions we are not going to know about today. And I'm sure that uh, the construction industry of all infrastructure, living accommodations, bridges we talked about, everything that is built by human hand, which is a huge amount of our world around us, and in the US a trillion dollar market or more, yep. uh, is going to be, this is going to be a very significant part of the new version of that. I'm quite certain of it. Uh, and that's an, a major contribution. I'm very grateful for you sharing, taking your time to, to share these results with us and for participating in the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Perfect, thank you. This episode is sponsored by Aptomica. Everything you need in modular robotics. Or robots up close? What's going on in robotics, online and on the road? If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe Follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our email newsletter on robotsindepth.com. You can also support the show on Patreon. I would like to thank the organizers of RoboBusiness US for their help when I recorded this interview.